You know, last Sunday is one of the exciting Sundays that we have that is on our church calendar. That's the, and that's Easter Sunday, or the Resurrection Sunday. And last Sunday, we celebrated the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, from the dead. And I want to say, we don't celebrate it once a year. We celebrate it every day, amen? Because he's the God of the living and not the God of the dead. Resurrection is something we celebrate all the time. And, and the Bible says in, in uh, Philippians 3.10 that, that we should know him and the power of his resurrection. And resurrection power must be worked if, working and active in our lives day in and day out. The Lord wants us to experience that every day. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, is a vital and essential part of our faith because if Christ be not risen from the dead, your faith and my faith is in vain. Uh, the, the, the resurrection of Christ is an essential part of the gospel message. It's an essential part of getting saved. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Paul said this, that if thou should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Notice the Bible puts an emphasis, not only should we have faith in his death and his shed blood for us, but we must have faith and believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We cannot separate the resurrection from the death of Christ. The resurrection is a vital part of our faith. That's why we have all of 1 Corinthians 15 written for us. It's a defense for the, for the resurrection. Now we know about the resurrection of Christ, but there's another resurrection. That's the resurrection of the dead. That's the resurrection of all dead. Now, I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit and come back to this. There are going to be two resurrections. Jesus refers to that in John chapter 5, verses 28 to 29. Would you go with me there, please? John chapter 5, verses 28 to 29. In that, these passages of Scripture, Jesus established right there at the beginning of his ministry the doctrine of the resurrection. Now, as I say that, let me say this this morning. Please don't list this. Miss, uh, 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 lose this. The resurrection is a Bible doctrine that was known in the Old Testament and is also known in the New Testament. The resurrection was not something unknown in the Old Testament. It was something very vital. In fact, we can go to the Old Testament. If, we, if, we, if I had time today, I could take you through many, many verses of Scripture that speak to that. For instance, you can go to Psalm 16. Psalm 16 speaks about, the, about a future resurrection. In fact, it speaks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ. You go to the book of Job. Job was the one who suffered greatly. Job knew about, he had faith and believed in the resurrection. By the way, Job lived at the same time. He was a contemporary of Abraham, the patriarch. And Job believed in the future resurrection. We find that in Job 14, 14 and Job 14, 19. Isaiah, Isaiah 26, 19. I'm going to read that to you a little bit later. Isaiah believed in a future resurrection. Abraham in Genesis 22, in Genesis 22, Abraham, even though they're not necessarily mentioned there per se, it is mentioned there, and is also referenced in Hebrews 11, Abraham had faith in a future resurrection. And so we can go through the Bible, and there's numerous verses that talk about that. The prophet Daniel, in Daniel 12, 2, spoke about those that will rise from the dead to everlasting life or to everlasting shame and punishment. So the Bible speaks about this. And Christ now, in John chapter 5, establishes doctrinal truth, a doctrinal, uh, doctrinal uh, truths and facts that we must hang on to. Listen to what he says here. If you're there in John chapter 5, look at verses 28 to 20. 29. Marvel not at this. In other words, don't be amazed. Don't be shocked at this. Marvel not at this, <coughs> he said. For the hour is coming. That means it's on the calendar. It's on the prophetic calendar. It's going to happen. He says, the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves. Who's in the graves? Everyone that's dead. All that are in the graves shall hear his voice, the voice of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul referenced to that in 1 Thessalonians 4 as he speaks about the rapture. He says, the voice of the Lord, the shout of the Lord. So Jesus is saying here that he says here that at the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and they shall come forth. And that's speaking about resurrection. They shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Now, Jesus speaks about, in, in Luke 20, about two worlds. He speaks about this world. He speaks about a future world, that world. He speaks about that there will be a resurrection of the dead. It's going to be two different resurrections. There's a resurrection of, the, of, of those who have died in Jesus Christ, and there will be the resurrection of those who died without Jesus Christ. Now, in this room this morning, you are in one of those two categories. You're either going to be part of the resurrection of those who are in Jesus Christ, or you're going to be part of the resurrection of those who are not in Jesus Christ. And Christ, 
Christ defined those two resurrections in chapter of John 5, 29, the resurrection to everlasting life, the resurrection to damnation. He speaks about this world and that world. He speaks about this world that we're living in and the world that will come. He's talking about, in verse 35, they which shall be accounted worthy of that world. What does he mean by all that? Well, the question comes down to this. Are you worthy to be part of that resurrection? Are you part, are you going to be, and when that hour comes, the resurrection, when you hear his voice, which resurrection will you be raised to? Which resurrection will you be a part of? The hour is coming. Are you worthy? Three things this passage of Scripture teaches us. You want to write that down this morning. Three things this passage of Scripture teaches us. Point number one, or fact number one, is we see Jesus refutes. Jesus refuses. What's going on here? Well, let's start off by understanding what the, the people that Jesus is talking to. Remember, Jesus is in the temple. There are three groups, three groups, there were, we would call them religious and political groups, that were against him. They were his enemies. Group number one were the Pharisees. The Pharisees, as far as religion was concerned, were considered the conservatives of religion. Now, they believed all of the Old Testament. They believed in a coming Messiah. They were very nationalistic. They were very pro-Jew. They were very pro-Zion, if you would. The Pharisees promoted their kingdom. They adhered to the word. The problem with the Pharisees, that even though they were considered uh, conservatives, they were traditionalists. They exalted their traditions. Their man-made laws, they added to the word of God or elevated above the word of God. They exalted their traditions over the truth. Now the same could be true of a church. A church could get so caught up with policies and procedures and uh, all these other things that we need to do, which are important because we need to have those in a church, but we can get so much. We can be, we can negligently elevate policies and procedures and how we do certain things and standards above the word of God. May I tell you this morning where a church stands, a church must find its operation from the Bible, the word of God. We operate operate according to the Word of God. We are not a biblical church if we are adulting traditions over truth. It is always truth over tradition. Now, truth should, should define our traditions, and truth should help us to establish our path, but nowhere should we ever get the place like the Pharisees did, where they were developing traditions that became, that, that exalted the traditions over truth. In other words, man's Word over God's Word. You know why you're in church this morning? Because you came to hear God's Word. You came to the church this morning because you didn't want to hear from Pastor Fong. You wanted to hear from God. You wanted to hear God's word. You want to know what God's word has to say. Now, the Pharisees hated Jesus because he kept correcting them about the fact that they were hypocrites. And he kept correcting them that they were exalting their traditions. And they, and they, were, they, were, they, were, doing, they were doing things that were not good. They were oppressing the widows and the orphans and those who were disadvantaged. And basically, they, they had political ideas that they really wanted to see achieved. Okay? That's group number one. They tried to trip up Jesus earlier. They failed. Crypt number two is called the Herodians. Now, the Herodians basically were a political group. They were loyal to Herod. They were loyal to Rome. Uh, they pretended they were religious, but they really weren't religion. Their religion was politics, okay? I remember the day back when they, uh, some of our, we had these conservative commentators on the radio, like Rush Limbaugh. And I remember some of my friends that I, back in college day, that some of my friends were, they thought Rush Limbaugh was like Jesus Christ there at that time. I had to correct a lot of them. I said, listen, you guys spend more time listening to Rush Limbaugh than you do going to church and hearing the word of God, amen, you know? And so that, that the Herodians were like that. They were very nationalistic in the sense they were all about Rome. They were all about that. But they were all about politics. And they hated Jesus because, they didn't, because Jesus, Jesus stood against things that were, were unbiblical there. And so they didn't like Jesus. And Jesus, they tried to entrap Jesus. They tried to discredit him in the previous passage of Scripture we looked at. And Jesus defeated them. Well, now we come to a third group. There's the Pharisees. There's the Herodians. They both failed. There's a third group still standing there. That's the Sadducees. That's who we're looking at now in verse 27. Now, please don't miss this because if you can understand what I'm going to tell you about the Sadducees, this will help you for the rest of the Bible when you read through the Bible of understanding Sadducean thought and how Sadducean thought is still with us. That's another message another day I'll, I'll talk about there. But the Sadducees, they were a religious group, but they had some bi major biblical shortcomings. The Sadducees were different from the Pharisees in that the Sadducees were liberal in theology. Now, liberal theology does not believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And liberal theology does not accept or believe that Jesus Christ is God. And liberal theology rejects the sinless life of Christ. And liberal theology rejects the virgin birth. 
And liberal theology rejects the substitutionary sacrificial death of Christ for every sinner. I mean, it can go on and on and on. Liberal theology has a different definition of eternity. Liberal theology teaches that if you live a good life, that will get you to heaven. But the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. So when you take an account of liberal theology, the Sadducees were among those who adhered to liberal theology. Now, Look what the Bible says first on verse 27. The Sadducees came to Jesus, and the Bible says, the Sadducees which deny there is any resurrection. If you go over to Acts 23, and I forget what verse, I don't know if it's verse 2 or verse 8. Acts 23, Paul, as he's addressing the Sadducees, the Bible tells us the Sadducees denied the following. Would you listen? They denied there was a resurrection. They denied there, was an, there were angels. They denied there was an afterlife. Now, notice in our passage, Jesus deals with every one of these because Jesus is going to refute every one of those, those, that false theology there, okay? They, re- they did not believe in an afterlife. They did not believe eternal life. They believed that when your physical body died, your spiritual body, your, your, your soul died. They, they just believed that you died there. There was, there was nothing after that. They did not believe in the providence of God. They did not believe that God uh, divinely intervened in the affairs of men. They did to believe that God was involved in the salvation process if there was such a thing in their mind. Uh, they did not believe in a life after death. They did not believe in angels. In fact, the Sadducees, really, their main thrust was twofold. Number one, their thrust, number one, was financial. The Sadducees were a tight-knit group uh, of people that basically had a hold on the high priestly office. Many of the priests that were functioning there in the temple were Sadducees, foremost of which every high priest for many years that uh, the high priest descended from the line of the Sadducees. In fact, the high priest at that time Annas, who we'll see later on at the crucifixion of Christ, Annas was the one who was the most hateful of the Sadducees, who hated Jesus Christ. Annas was a Sadducee. Now, they they were a tight-knit group. They were very financially well off. When they elevated Annas to be the head high priest, Annas basically took advantage of the financial situation that was there to help these Sadducees get set up in a wonderful way. So to be a Sadducee meant that you were going to be financially well off. The Sadducees, remember earlier we studied how when Jesus came, uh, when he entered into Jerusalem, he entered the temple, and the first thing he saw were the money changers, because everybody was in Jerusalem uh, from all over there to celebrate the Passover. And so they came from different areas, and they had to do an exchange of their money there. They went to the money changers. We would call that currency translation today, but these were called money changers. In some foreign countries, they still call uh, currency translation uh, money changers. I remember being, Brother AJ, I remember being in the Philippines there in, uh, in Alabong, and I had to change out some money, and I walked down to a shopping mall, and I I found a sign there that says money changers. I said, oh, that's great. This is just like the Bible. They met, you know, money changers there. And I got, got my money. It was cheaper there than if I wanted the airport to do it there. But they, they call them money changers. Well, the, the Sadducees, they controlled the money changers. They profited all that. They controlled the selling of the animals in that court of the Gentile. So they had a hold on all this. It was great profitability for them to do that. So when Jesus, remember, he went into the temple and he threw over their tables and the money was flying everywhere and he cast out all the animals, guess who was offended and were upset the most about it? The Sadducees, because he just interrupted their financial enterprise. So as we get to verse 27, the Sadducees of the three groups that hated Jesus are the last ones. Now in their minds, they're thinking, we're, we're going to get Jesus. We're going to trip him up. The Pharisees fail. The Herodians fail. We're not going to fail. These Sadducees do not believe any of the essential things that are part of our doctrines. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish historian, if you read his antiquities, he said he makes a statement about, about the Sadducees. He summed them up as saying, they are mean-spirited, they're heartless, they're patrician, which means they're just all about education and scholarliness, and they're philosophical materialists. They were materialists. They did not believe in afterlife. So everything about them, as we look at these questions they're giving to Jesus, is all about, the, about this world, about this life, because all they lived before and all they were preoccupied was this world. Something else about these Sadducees. These Sadducees only believed, as far as the Old Testament, they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They only believed and read the books of Moses. Now, we call that the book of Moses, the Pentateuch, which means the five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or the Jewish, the Jewish scholars would call it the Torah. And so since they only believed in those books, they did not deny the other Old Testament books, 
But they didn't want to accept the Old Testament, other Old Testament books because the other Old Testament books spoke about Christ, they spoke about the Messiah, and they spoke about the, the resurrection. And so as they held on to the five books of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible uh, of the Old Testament, they, they asserted that Moses never mentioned anything about the resurrection, that there's no inference at all in Genesis or Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy, they infer there's no mention at all about any resurrection. And so we see that there because Jesus references that in that. Now, as we look at all this, I give you that background because Jesus refused them. And they started with the story, they said, because they came to him, and you got to remember, Jesus is all-knowing. Amen? Aren't you glad he knows everything? He's all-knowing. He knew their hearts. He knew they were wicked. He knew that they had an agenda to, to try to, 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 to discredit him. So they come with this. First of all, they wanted to discredit him about the resurrection. Number two, they wanted to discredit him about the afterlife. They wanted to discredit him about judgment. They wanted to discredit him about his understanding about the five books of the, the first five books of the Bible. I mean, they were just all about to prove that Jesus was not the Son of God. And as we read this passage, they failed and they failed miserably. Amen. So they come with this question. And in my readings and studies, some people think, some, well, at least one, one writer believes that they got this from a Jewish fable uh, that they read that was kind of a gross fable. I'm not going to tell you about the fable. Maybe if you want to take me to lunch someday, I'll tell you about that fable there. But it's kind of a gross, kind of ridiculous lunch, uh, not lunch, but uh, a fable there. And they asked this question. And remember, the question was meant to stump Jesus. You know, have you ever argued with, like I said, have you ever argued with someone who's a cynic or skeptic? Some of them ask these questions have nothing to do with the context, but they want to ask you a question because they just want to discredit you. And that's what they're trying to do to Jesus. They said, okay, here's a man. He's a Jewish man for that. And in our law, Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6, we have, a, we have what's called the Leverett Law. Now, the Leverett Law coincided with the people and culture of that day. And the people and culture of that day, one of the key things that they had in mind was land that was owned by the family was supposed to stay in the land, was supposed to stay in the family. And so what they did was the Leveret law, and, Le- and Leveret basically means the husband's brother. That's what Leveret means, a husband's brother. If you read Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6, it defines what I'm going to talk about here. And it basically means this. If a man marries and he dies without children, he's childless during his marriage and he dies, then there's a problem because in our way of looking things, in, in, our, in our laws of intestacy here, the land, the, the, the land hopefully will stay with the family. But in that time, there was danger of the land being sold off or not staying in the family. They wanted to make sure the land stay in the family. That's why we read over in, in, in uh, Proverbs 22, remove not the ancient landmark. That's where we read about that, you know, we read about, we read about the story there in the book of Ruth there as far as Elimelech and Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, okay? Another story, another time. And so, to keep the land in the family, the brother that was nearest of age of, to the one who died, and I'm going to call him the decedent, okay? The decedent means the one who's passed away. The brother that was nearest in age to him had the responsibility under the Leveret law to marry the wife. Now, the key was so that the, because this brother, the original husband, uh, they wanted to keep the land that he received in the family. So the brother would marry her, okay? Now, it, now, and hopefully they would have children. But in our story here, there are seven brothers. Each of them dies. Brother number one marries this woman. He dies childless. Brother number two now under the Leverett law, he has to marry this wife. He dies childish. This goes all the way down to the seventh brother. And you can imagine, because it sounds very absurd, by the time to get the seventh brother, I mean, the youngest brother, the seventh brother, his age, she's old enough to be his mother. How many understand what I'm saying there, amen? It's just very absurd and kind of gross, to be honest with you there. It's kind of incestuous in many ways when you look at that there. But it's just, but they, but they, they didn't care about how absurd the story sounded, okay? That, that's not their point. They, they wanted to know, they said, we get down to verse 33, and it says, the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. And they said, last of all, the woman died also. Now, they're not contesting the Leveret law. What they're contesting, what they're trying to discredit Jesus in, is about the resurrection. And so here's their question. And they really thought this through. They thought, we really have him stumped. We really have him now. We're going to discredit him. They said, last of all, the woman died also. Then we get to verse 33. Therefore, 
in the resurrection, which they did not believe. In the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? Now you can imagine as that question is asked, everyone there knew the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. Some of them had heard Christ declare at Lazarus' resurrection, which was just a few days before in the city of Bethany, they heard, they heard him declare that wonderful doctrinal statement, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth on me, though he are dead, yet shall he live. Now some of them were there, they had followed Christ from Bethany and Bethabara, they would followed him all the way down there to Jerusalem because they wanted to be part of what was going on, so they recognized that. And so they're thinking, I wonder what he's going to say with this. They said, for therefore in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. Now if you look at verses 34 to 38, remember point number one is Jesus refutes him. Now, Jesus is going to refute all their doctrinal errors, all their doctrinal problems. He's going to refute all of those and bring us back to what is reality there, okay? Number one, would you notice, Jesus refutes them concerning the fact there is life after death. He refutes their unbelief that there is no afterlife. He refutes that and he, and he proclaims there is life after death. He speaks about in verse 34, this world and that world. This world is the world we're living in. You and I are born physically into this world, okay? Pinch yourself, you're alive, amen? You are physically born in this world. But that world he's speaking about, the context of that world, he's talking about eternity. He's speaking about the afterlife. He's speaking about who will be part of those who go to heaven. Now that world, you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. You either know Jesus Christ your Savior or you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. Look how Jesus positions the wording there. The children of this world marry and are given in this marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. He's talking about those who go into eternity and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Christ is telling them there is life after death. Christ is telling them there is a future resurrection. He's telling them, I'm going to tell you here because I've taught that already, that it is there. He speaks about two different kinds of children. He speaks about the children of this world and the children of the fallen world. He calls them the children of God and the children of the resurrection. So he refutes them about the, that there's life after death. He, secondly, he refutes them concerning this life and the life to come. I just talked about that, about this world and that world. Watch this, okay? He says about this world, our mindset of this. He says, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage. Now, when he speaks about that, he's not, he's not putting down marriage. In fact, the Bible exalts marriage. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. God exalts marriage. In fact, the first, the first marriage we find is recorded in Genesis chapter 2 when God, God made Eve out of Adam and brought Eve to Adam. And the Bible gives us Genesis 2.24, the, the doctrine of marriage. He says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they too shall become one flesh. He, he gives us the principle of marriage. Jesus expounded on that previous to this over in, in uh, chapter 19 of Matthew, not Matthew 19. He spoke about that. And so we must understand marriage is a vital part of this life. Marriage is a vital part of this world. Marriage is by me. And when I speak about marriage, I'm talking about marriage between a man and a woman. I'm talking about a biblical marriage. Amen. I'm talking about the, with marriage. Marriage is the only means by which procreation can come about. He says now, he's speaking about, now you're asking about marriage, whose wife should she be? He says, the children of this world, they marry, and he said, he says, they marry and are given in marriage, okay? Now, now, now we know marriage is vital in this life, but in the world to come, as far as eternity, he makes a very important statement here. He says, but in that world, they that are counted worthy to, to, uh, to obtain that world and the resurrection of the dead, neither marry nor given in marriage. Now, watch this. In this world, what is our preoccupation? Our preoccupation is with ourselves. Our preoccupation is with our physical needs. Nothing wrong with that. Our preoccupation, listen, in a few minutes, uh, you will hear a bunch of stomachs growling because people want to go to lunch. We're preoccupied about lunch, amen? And we're making the hard decision. Where do we go for lunch? Do we go for fried chicken or we go for pho? I'll go for pho, amen, you know? Now, what, do, what do you go for lunch? What are you going to do with that? Are you going to go to buffet or are you going to go to something more lighter? You know, whatever. You know, we're preoccupied about, the, about that. We're, we're preoccupied about, about marriage. There's nothing wrong with it. God wants you to be preoccupied with that. But he's saying there's a contrast. 
In this world, we are preoccupied with our needs. We've got we've to go to work tomorrow. We've got to put uh, food on the table. We've got to pay our bills. We've got to get our children through school. We've got to take care of our health. We've got to take care of our parents. We've got to take care of our sick ones. Whatever maybe. We have these preoccupations. Those are the necessities. Those are the essentials of this world. But in that world, look what he says here. In the world to come, he says, he says here, he, he tells us something very important. He says, neither do they marry nor are given in marriage. Now, please don't be sad about what I'm going to say to you, but there's no marriage in heaven. Someone who doesn't have a good marriage is thinking, that's a relief, amen? <laughs> doesn't work that way. And someone who's very happy in their marriage, which most of our people are, amen? There's a sadness that gripped your heart when I said that. Don't be sad. You know why? Because the greatness of your love here is going to be even greater in eternity. If you love your spouse now, think about how much you'll love them in eternity, amen? You'll love them just like Jesus did, Amen? just like Jesus does. So he wants to understand that in the world to come, we're not occupied about eating, drinking, making money, paying our bills, taking care of the kids, keeping the kids straight. You know why? Because we're eternal. And because we're eternal, you know what our preoccupation is? Jesus Christ himself, amen? We're gonna be preoccupied with Christ. We're gonna be preoccupied with worshiping the Lord and honoring God. People say, what are you gonna do in heaven? I remember I had a discipleship class and somebody asked this question. And they said, well, what are we gonna do in heaven? I said, man, it's gonna be great. We're gonna sing. We're gonna be around Jesus. We're gonna honor him. We're gonna be ministering to one another. We're gonna be loving one another. We're gonna be singing all the time. And the person said, that sounds kind of boring. Is that all we're gonna do? Well, if you're, you're, you're thinking in the context of this world, it sounds boring. But you think in the context of that world, we're eternal. We're just like him. Because the Bible says we shall see him as he is and be just like him, okay? And so we're, we're going to be glorified. So Christ is talking about resurrection and glorification here. So the life to come, he's correcting them. The life to come is better than the life that we are now in. People always say this, well, you know, a person dies, they're in a better place. They're in the best place. Heaven's the best place you could be. It is better, but it's the best place to be. The Bible says to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Thirdly, he refutes them something else. Now remember, he's refuting them on this. He's telling them there is a resurrection. There is an afterlife. There is life after death. He says there is a life after this. He says, and he says your preoccupation will be different. But remember, there's one outstanding thing. Because, because as you look at these scriptures, he refutes the fact, he refutes them about resurrection. He refutes them about oh, that there being a life after them. In fact, look at verse 36. He emphatically says in verse 36, neither can they die anymore. If you're counted worthy, you've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. You're, part of that resur you're going to be part of that resurrection, which will be the next big event on the prophetic calendar. And he says, you're not going to die anymore. By the way, listen. We all will physically die in this world. The Bible says in Romans 5, 12, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so then death has passed upon all men for all of sin. We're all going to die. But I have some good news for you. If you know Jesus Christ as Savior, here's what happened. You're born once, you only die once. You die physically, you never die spiritually. That's what Jesus meant there in verse 36. Neither shall they die anymore, okay? But if you're born in this world once and you live this life and you do not receive Christ as Savior, you're going to die twice. There's a first death, which is physical. There's a second death, which we'll get into a little bit later, where you're separated for all eternity from God. So he says, neither can they die anymore, and they are equal unto the angels. Now, that's important because they didn't believe there was any angels. Now, that just blew a hole right into their false theology because being like the angels means this. We're going to be eternal. We're going to be holy. Uh, we're going to be worshiping the Lord. We're going to be singing just like the angels. We're going to have purity in our thoughts, and we're going to be serving the Lord. We're going to be just like the angels, ministering spirits there. And he says, and they are the children of God being the children of the resurrection. Now, both are the same. Being a child of God is being a child of the resurrection. Jesus told them earlier in John 1, 12, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So Jesus refused him. But the third thing that this still is outstanding here, he refused him about everlasting life, he refused him about the life hereafter. But there's one thing still hanging. The, Pharise the, the, the Sadducees taught that the five book was, books of Moses never mentioned anything about, about the resurrection. Moses never said anything, but Jesus now is about to refute that. Now remember, he's just, he's just blown a hole into their... Into to their false doctrine about resurrection, we shift from verse 36 to verse 37. Look at what verse 37 says. 
Now that the dead are raised, in other words, he's saying, now that I have shown you, the dead will be raised. There, are, there will be a resurrection. And there is a future resurrection for those who know Christ as their Savior. And there is a future resurrection for those who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush. What's he talking about there? Well, the reference there, when you read it later on, is Exodus chapter 3, and specifically Exodus 3.6. He's talking about when the Lord appeared to Moses at what we call the burning bush. The bush was burning, but it was not consumed. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush experience. Now, when God revealed himself to Moses, you have to remember, Moses was scared. Moses was somewhat resigned that he was a failure. Moses was even somewhat of a skeptic in some things. And the Bible says, now that the dead, now that, now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed to the bush. And here's what the verse specifically says. The Lord appeared to Moses and he made this profound statement. I am. Now the words I am are translated Yahweh or Lord. He's defining who he is as the self-existent eternal God. I am. Not I was. I am. I always am. Always have been. Always will be. I am. God deals with us in the present tense. Amen. And everything that God's going to say here to Moses is this. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, why is that important? How is the resurrection that? Well, first of all, as God makes that statement to Moses, is that it is a present tense statement. It is not a past tense. God could have said, I was the God of Abraham and I was the God of Isaac and I was the God of Jacob because they were dead. No, he didn't say that because then he would say that they're dead and there's no hope. No, he's saying present tense, I am because they're alive. They may be dead physically, but their lives spiritually. Their souls went to be with the Lord. Listen, the Bible says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now, as he's talking about, there's two things that are referenced here. Number one, that God, when he gave the covenant relationship to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he gave them that covenant to enjoy fellowship with him. Did you know the Lord wants to have fellowship with you? Did you know John, 1 John 1, 3 tells us that we want, we're to have fellowship with the Lord? That's why you're in church. God doesn't want you to just have fellowship with him when you just come Sunday morning. He wants you to have fellowship with him 24-7, amen? He wants you to have fellowship with him all the time, a, a fellowship that's sweet and a fellowship that's wonderful. He wants you to enjoy the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. So number one, he gave me the statement because God had fellowship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Number two, God made that statement because he had a covenant relationship with them. Now, the covenant was not to die. The covenant was ever Everlasting. It spoke about a seed. In other words, a, that a son would be born, and that would be to Abraham, and that would be Isaac. And that a great nation would proceed out of Isaac. And that nation is the nation of Israel as it's growing. And not only a, a seed, not only a nation, but also the promised land. God promised them a land that he'd make a great nation. He had a covenant relationship with his people Israel there. And it wasn't a dead, it wasn't a dead covenant. It was a living covenant. It was alive. And God is asserting here that, listen, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, they're very much alive right now and so much alive he said I want you to know when I appeared before Moses and stood in Moses I represented to Moses that I'm the God of the living and not the God of the dead listen resurrection implies there is life not death so the question we ask you is it is it there does the Bible really declare well Genesis 22 tells us a story where God called upon Abraham to take his son Isaac up to a mountain called Mount Moriah. And there he was supposed to sacrifice him before the Lord. Remember that story? Abraham obeyed God. Abraham was sad, but Abraham had faith in God. And several things are told us in Hebrews 11, if you turn there for just a minute. Things that were told as he, before he even got to Mount Moriah, that Abraham, he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. He looked for a better inheritance, a better country. Remember that? He had faith in a hereafter. He had faith in a life hereafter. He had faith in a resurrection. Abraham has his son Isaac. He gets two servants with him. He gathers the wood and whatever he's going to use to make this fire, puts it on some donkeys. They make, I think, a three-day journey. They come to the base of Mount Moriah. They stop there. 
He tells his servants, now you stay here, and I'm going to paraphrase it. He says, you're going to stay here. I'm going to go up yonder with my son Isaac, and, and I'm going to go there, but we shall return. He didn't say, I will return. He said, we will return. We'll come back. And he read it there. He says, we'll come back there. That's in Genesis 22. So strong was that statement. Here's what the writer of Hebrews, go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 that the writer of Hebrews, to substantiate that, makes this statement about Abraham's faith and future resurrection. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17. If you follow this, everything else goes real quickly here. He said in Hebrews eleven seventeen, 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Now, before that, it says he desired a better country. And before that, it said he, uh, he sojourned in the land, looking, looking uh, for the promises and for a city whose builder maker is God. He says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Now, he wants to know, Abraham only had one son from Sarah. And when he was born, Abraham was 100 years old. And when this occasion happened, he's about 130 years old when we get to Genesis 22. And he's enjoyed the fellowship with his son all, of, all that time there. And, of course, the sacrifice of, of that, that Abraham was called to do of Isaac is a symbol or picture, if you would, of God sending his son Jesus Christ to earth to die for our sins. He sent him to be our sacrifice for our sin. And so he's taking Isaac up to, up to this mountain. And the Bible says in verse 18, Hebrews eleven eighteen, 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now Abraham could have taken, he could have thought in terms of this world. If he thought in terms of this world, he would have thought, only have one seed, only one son. He said, Lord, if I, if I sacrifice this son, then the promise is broken and the covenant cannot be fulfilled. And he's just saying, Lord, then that makes you a liar. And that means that, means that Lord, there will be no nation and there will be no promise and there will be no Messiah for, for, for our sins. And he could have taken that path, but he didn't do so because Abraham had faith in his creator. He had faith in his Savior because in Genesis 15, 6, the Bible says, Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him unto righteousness. So he had faith in God. He had faith in the Lord. And the Bible says in verse 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac thy seed shall be called. Now he had great faith as he's ascending up that mountain that he said, God, you said that in this seed, in Isaac, the seed will be called. You promised that a great nation will come out of Isaac. You promised not only to be a great nation, you promised there would be an abundance of land that would give us. And Abraham did not walk up that hill defeated. And he didn't walk up that mountain mountain of Moriah thinking that God was a loser or that he was the no he walked up that mountain with great faith that there is a resurrection right. now we get to verse 19 and notice in Hebrews eleven nineteen, 19 he says it says this that in Isaac shall thy seed be called accounting that God was able to raise him up Amen. even from the dead from whence also received him in a figure and I could go off on this here's what I want you to understand when we look at what God said to, to Moses at the burning bush that I am, I am mean, the self-existent, ever-living God. I am the God of Isaac and the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And he says, I want you to know, Abraham believed in the resurrection. He told his servants, I'm coming back. And the Bible says in Hebrews eleven nineteen, 19, accounting that God was able to raise him. Here's Abraham's faith. As he took, he took Isaac and he led him up to the top there. And he, got, he made that altar. And he put Isaac on that altar. I mean, you put a, he put a grown 30-year-old man on that altar. And I can imagine him, as he laid him there, he's about to plunge the knife and to kill him, then offer him as a, bur as a burning sacrifice before God. God stopped him. Listen, Abraham in his heart did not doubt for one moment. He did not doubt for one moment that he's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. He did not doubt for one moment that God would raise his son up. He had no doubt for one moment that God was able to raise him up. There had been no precedent of a resurrection. Now there was Enoch, who Enoch was raptured out of this world. Enoch did not die. But there was no precedent prior to that of a bodily resurrection. But he had faith that God's word would not fail. And he had faith that God was real. And he had faith in fact what Jesus said here, that he's not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. Amen. Jesus refutes them. He's just torn holes and torn to pieces their argument that there's no resurrection, there's no afterlife, and that, there's no, and that Moses' writings did not say anything about that. Now, number one, Jesus refused. Let's go a little bit further. Number two, notice Jesus reveals. Let's bring this down to application. We're almost done. Say amen if you're with me. A little bit of teaching with them. Do you need to understand that before we get to what, what, the essence of what, what's the application? Now notice Jesus reveals truth, amen? Right. Because Jesus is all truth. Right. All right, truth number one. Jesus reveals there's not only life after death, but there's judgment after death. Right. 
Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed to men once to die, and after this is the judgment. Now, if you're a fatalist and you think, I'm going to die, there's nothing left, you're wrong. The Bible and Jesus declares it is appointed men once to die, after this the judgment. There will be death. Now, I'm not trying to be morbid, but there will be death. And there's judgment after death. Number two, truth number two. In accord with that, either you are a child of this world or you're a child of God. Look with me in Ephesians chapter two. In Ephesians two, the Bible says this in verse one. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. Now, verse one, he's speaking, verse one to three, He's speaking to believers in Jesus Christ. He's speaking to people that are saved. You're saved, say amen. amen. Okay? He's saying, we were once, before we got saved, we were dead in trespass and sin. We were spiritually dead, but he's made us alive. That's resurrection, amen? amen. You who he has made alive, okay? That's what baptism, this is why baptism is important, brethren. Baptism symbolizes that we were dead in sin, but thank God we come about the water, we have newness of life through Jesus Christ, amen? It's a picture of death, burial, and resurrection, okay? He says, you hath he quickened which were dead in trespass and sin. Now notice verses two and three. Verses two and three, he speaks about what we wore when we were dead in trespass and sin. By the way, he's speaking about what you are today if you're not saved. Number one, you're a child of the devil. He said this in verse, in verse 2, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Number one, if you're not saved, you're a child of the devil. Number two, you're a child of this world. Number three, he says the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, you're a child of disobedience. Number, th- number four in verse three, you're a child of wrath. He defines that, 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 our, that who we belong to, our father. That's why Jesus told the Jews, you are of your father, the devil. We're children of this world. We're children of the devil. We were children of disobedience. We were children, we were children under, under the wrath of God. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty frightening and darkening thing to think about, but he's just telling us what kind of child we are. Now, the Bible says in, in, in Luke chapter 20, you're either a child of the world or you're a child of God. Thank God if you're saved, you're a child of, the, you're a child of God, amen? Because John 1, 12 says, and to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. Notice number three, truth number three. Number, truth number one, there is, there's a life after death and there's judgment. Truth number two, you're either a child of the world, you're a child of God. Now, which one are you? Truth number three, Jesus reveals the children of God, who are also children of the resurrection, never die. Go back with me, John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus said this before he raised Lazarus from the dead. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall live. That's hope, amen? That's a lively hope. Verse 26. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe us out this. So, the next big event on the prophetic calendar is to rapture the believer. There's a series of things that happen with that. The rapture of the believer is when God, Christ, unannounced, because we don't have a timeline, he doesn't, he didn't tell us when, could happen now. He descends from heaven into our firmament, into our atmosphere, the first heaven. As he descends, he gives a victor's shout. It's a victorious shout. In fact, we believe, according to what the Bible says in Revelation 4.1, Jesus will utter three words. Come up hither. It's a call for all of us who are saved that we're going to be raptured up. Now, before we get raptured up or taken out of this world, all our loved ones who predeceased us and their bodies are buried, I think about my father and my grandmother, who I had the privilege of leading to Christ, my wife's father and mother and my wife's, uh, one of her younger brothers and several nieces and nephews we've had that have predeceased us. When the shout happens before you and I are raptured, those loved ones who were saved and their souls have already gone to be the Lord, their bodies are going to be raised. They're going to be resurrected. And they're going to be resurrected. And, and it, it, this is not some zombie movie now, okay? This is not Walking Dead stuff, Amen. 
This is resurrection life, amen? Okay, zombies are gross. We're gonna be raised in the likeness of Jesus Christ, amen? We're gonna be raised to be just like him as they saw his glorious body. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, and 1 Corinthians 15 tells us some things about this resurrection and why we only die once. He says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption, okay? These physical bodies we have, which are corruptible, which are sinful, cannot go to heaven the way they are. They have to be changed. So the dead in Christ, their incorruptible, their corruptible bodies will be raised incorruptible. Their mortal bodies become immortal. Our bodies will be raised and will be changed and glorified just like his. So all of our bodies are changed. Theirs are resurrected, ours are changed. Look at some things he says. He says in verse 52 of 1 Corinthians 15, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. They're not decomposing. There's no decomposition. There's no decaying. They should be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. I mean, it doesn't matter if the body that is in the grave has been there for 500 years and it's turned to dust. It's going to be raised incorruptible. It's going to have a body again. Amen? Amen. What kind of body? An incorruptible body. He, he tells us that here in verse 52. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must be put on immortality. Then in verse 54, he quotes from Isaiah, where Isaiah says, death is swallowed up in victory. Okay, that's, the, that's the, the, the victory to every believer there. And he makes a statement, he says in verse 55, oh, death, where is thy sting? And oh, grave, where is thy victory? He says, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's what he's saying. You and I can rejoice because we're victorious in Jesus Christ. We have victory in Christ. What is that victory? The victory is death has no hold on us. Victory is this, that, that death cannot hold us, just as death can hold Christ. Now, our bodies might be laid in the grave, but they're going to be raised incorruptible. Amen? Immortal. Incorruptible. In 2 Timothy 1, it says of Jesus Christ, he abolished death and brought to life life and immortality. Listen, he got rid of death, amen, when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. It's a victory for every one of us. You don't have to live with defeat, but with victory. Then notice, fourthly, the Bible reveals the doctrine of the resurrection frequently in the Old Testament. Let me just read a few. Listen to what Job said in Job 19. He said in verse 25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And listen to this. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, Job's saying, look, I'm going to die. Corruption will set in. Worms will eat up my body. We know that's decomposition, that's decay, that's corrupt, corruption. He said, and though after my skin worms destroy his body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Amen. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. You know what Job is saying there? He believed in a future resurrection. I'll look at later on. In Psalm 16, verse 10, is the prophecy of our Lord's resurrection. But notice Isaiah. Look at Isaiah's words. This is wonderful. Isaiah's words in Isaiah 26, 19. Thy dead men shall live... Together with my dead body shall they arise. He believed in a future resurrection. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the, as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Daniel said in Daniel 12, 2, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken. That's talking about resurrection, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So Jesus is asserting that for everyone who's a believer in Jesus Christ, that the doctrine of the resurrection, contrary to what the Sadducees said, is all over the Bible there, Amen. Fifthly, this is so important. There is a life after death. There are angels. The first five books of Moses do to assert, declare to us that there is a resurrection. We know that after the resurrection, there's a judgment. We know that the Bible declares that, but I want you to say this number five. Would you notice this here real quickly? Fifthly, Jesus reveals resurrection is coming. The hour is coming when the dead shall be raised. And Jesus declared that in verse 38 of Luke 20, for when he, after he talked about the present tense and the fellowship God was having with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. I want to understand something today. God wants to have fellowship with you. And God wants to enjoy a vibrant, living fellowship. First, read the Bible and let the words of the Bible come alive into your heart. Secondly, pray to God. And watch God exercise faith and watch God answer prayer. And God, watch God 
work in your behalf. I could go around this room today to talk about brothers and sisters of Christ from this side of the room all the way to the other side of the room who've had experiences and situations where we, we had a, maybe a loved one that we was, was on the 11th hour, maybe just at the 11th, 59th hour of their life, and how God gave them enough consciousness to get saved. I mean, I'm talking about he's the God of the living, not of the God of the dead. We have seen God change circumstances and situations. Only by faith we can see God do. God is not done working in your life and mine. He's the God who's begun a good work in you and will continue to perform it to the day of Christ. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. He's not a God who was. He's the God who is. Amen? Amen. You must believe that he is and reward of them that diligently seek him. Some of us live our lives and go our lives as if God is dead. I want you to know God is not dead. He's alive. Right. He's living. He's living in our lives and he wants to prove himself strong in your life and mine. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Amen? Well, number one, Jesus refutes. Number two, Jesus reveals. Number three, as we close, this is important. I'm done. Jesus refutes, Jesus reveals, Jesus resurrects. Go back to John 5, 28, 29. Two resurrections. Resurrection number one. The dead in Christ shall hear his voice. And they shall be raised incorruptible. The dead in Christ will hear his voice. And the Bible defines it this way. They will be raised to everlasting, to the resurrection of life. Now, the first resurrection, there's three groups. First of all, included in the re first resurrection is the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the forerunner of the resurrection. He's the first fruits of the resurrection, okay? Now, the second group is you and me. If we, in this life, our life is cut short and we're buried into the ground, the dead in Christ serves everyone who put their faith in Jesus Christ after he died on the cross and rose over the dead. Everyone who's died and their bodies are buried in the ground or put in a tomb or, for that matter, even cremated. When they hear his voice, when we hear his voice, we should be raised to the resurrection of life. Amen. Amen. The hour is coming when they will hear his voice. They should be raised to the resurrection of life. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, there's a third group. The third group are those Jews and non-Jews who put their faith in Christ during the tribulation and were martyred for their faith because they took a stand for Christ. They did not receive the mark of the beast. They were martyred for their faith. They've died. They've been buried. Maybe their bodies were left in the street. They will be raised as well at the end of the tribulation. Old Testament saints are included with that. Their bodies should be raised. So the first resurrection involves everyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ or saved. That group is the one Jesus referred to in Luke 20, verse 30, 36, I think it is, or 37, Verse 35, maybe verse 35, he says, And they that shall be counted worthy of that world and the resurrection of the dead. When it says that, it's speaking about every one of them coming to that place where they exercise their faith in Jesus Christ to believe on him that he died for their sins and rose again from the dead. Those groups of people, those groups of people will be part of the resurrection of the dead. That means for you and me, who put our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, we're part of that resurrection to everlasting life. There's a second resurrection as we close. That second resurrection Christ refers to as a resurrection unto damnation. It's referred to by Daniel as to shame and everlasting contempt. The second resurrection occurs at the end of this age. The end of this age is that after the seven years of tribulation, Christ will come, he will establish his kingdom on earth, he'll reign for a thousand years, then he closes out this age. Are you with me? Amen. That's the end of the world. That's the end of the world. The heavens and the earth as we know it will be burned away and a new heaven and new earth will be made. It is at the end of the world, all those who died and did not put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, they did not get saved. They will hear his voice as well. Because the shout of the Lord will call them, come up hither. And in Revelation 20, 
we are told that the second resurrection will happen like this. That death and hell will give up their dead. Everyone who dies without Christ, their soul will spend all of eternity in hell. At the second resurrection, the shout of the Lord, the dead will be raised, but not incorruptible. Hell will give up all of its dead. Hell's going to be emptied out. All those who came out of hell are those who are dead, so it's one and the same. They're going to come before the throne of Jesus Christ because he's the judge of every man. Because the Bible says in John 5, God, God the Father appointed judgment to Christ. We also know that from over there from, um, from Acts chapter 17. He's the judge of all the earth. There will be what we call the great white throne judgment. Every sinner who rejected Jesus Christ will see this shimmering, lustrous throne, its purity, its whiteness, its holiness, which reflects the holiness of God. And to some extent, their eyes may be blinded by it. And before every sinner, every sinner will stand before Christ for their final judgment. Bear in mind, when Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and mine, our sins were judged on him. Our sins, which we deserve to be judged for, were judged on Jesus Christ. Every sinner who rejects Christ and does not receive him will stand at that great white throne judgment and what will be rehearsed from them from the moment of their conception to the day of their death, that they had every opportunity to receive Christ every time they came to a service like here at Heritage Baptist Church and heard the gospel preach and an invitation made to get saved, every time they were given a gospel tract, every time they were invited to come to church by you and to hear the gospel, every time you witnessed to that loved one, they rejected Christ, they will be reminded of every opportunity they had. Most importantly, they will be reminded that Jesus Christ died on the cross and their sins, they were judged for them on Christ, but they will be shown that of every opportunity to believe on him, but they rejected him as Savior. They said, not today, Lord. Not today. They turned their back on Christ and refused him. And at the great white throne judgment, it's too late to believe. It's too late to be saved. And the Bible says, the Lord will open one last book. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life will be cast in the lake of fire. The lake of fire is already existent. Satan's been thrown in the lake of fire. The beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet during tribulation are in, that, are, they're in there. Some angels, which we read about there in Jude, the book of Jude, are already there. The final destination for every person who has, does not know Jesus Christ as Savior their final destination will be for all of eternity in that lake of fire. Death and hell will be cast in the lake of fire. And here's what the Bible sums up that last, that last area. This is the second death. That's the second death. And why did Christ do all this, tell this? Because he wants you to be saved. He wants you to go to heaven. He wants you to be those who are counted worthy to obtain that world. How can you be counted worthy to obtain that world? Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Faith in the shed blood, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. So, the hour is coming. Sinner, are you worthy? Are you ready? You're not saved this morning. Would you accept my invitation today, whether you're a man or woman, and receive Christ as your Savior? Secondly, for every one of us, Resurrection is a wonderful thing for us. Amen? Amen? Resurrection represents reunion with loved ones who have predeceased us. Resurrection represents what God is doing in our life now because he's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. The moment you got saved, God began doing a good work in you. Everything God does in your life is never bad. It's good. He wants you to grow in the Lord. He wants you to taste and see that the Lord is good. 
He wants you to hunger and thirst after righteousness. He wants you to experience the spirit-led and the spirit-filled life. He wants to experience the victory that is found in Jesus Christ. He wants you, as Colossians says, to be fruitful in every good work, always abounding in the Lord. He wants to experience the love of God and the joy of Jesus Christ. He wants to experience letting him carry your burdens. He wants you to experience answered prayer. He wants you to experience peace in the midst of the storm. He wants you to experience, you don't have to live a life of worry and anxiety and frustration. You can live a life of peace and enjoyment and love because Jesus Christ rests in your heart. He's the God of the living, the God of the dead. Too many of us as Christians, we're living in the past. We should be living for now. We should be living for right now for a Savior who loves you. My challenge for you this morning, live for God. Realize you're going to be res- you're saved. You're going to be resurrected. You don't want to waste your life. Live your life for the glory of God. Don't waste your life. Use every opportunity to serve him, to honor him, to worship him.